Um, my name is Greg Stark. I've been a Postgres developer since um, about 10 years ago, 19, sorry, 2006. And that's about half of Postgres's lifetime. Postgres was released as open source in 1995, 1996. This is the 20th anniversary of Postgres's open source life. Um, so there's another talk by Magnus, the look at the elephant's trunk with the new features. I'm, I'm going to present some of uh, the history of Postgres and how it's gotten to where it is today. Um, so I call it look at the elephant's tail. Um, 20 years, this is the 20th anniversary of, of Postgres's open source release. Uh, so it's a good time to look back. Um, I'm going to look at specifically the sorting code. And that's kind of a narrow little slice of Postgres. It's an interesting slice to look at, I think, because it's very, it affects a lot of user um, uh, queries, a lot of user visible behavior. It impacts uh, uh, building indexes. It impacts several other parts as well as obviously queries. Um, and it's nicely isolated from the rest of the source base. It's its, it's own module. It's, uh, um, um, it's its own module, and it's, it's, it has an API that cleanly separates it from the rest of Postgres. Um, and it's, it's interesting to look at the history because it shows you um, the, the people that were involved, the priorities of the day, and you can sort of see how the priorities have changed over time um, as the usage patterns have changed and the hardware has changed and, and so on. Um, one of the things I want to, to highlight, though, is that it's not just about making Postgres faster. Uh, every release, there's, a, there's some notes in the release notes saying the new version is 5% faster or 10% faster or whatever. And it's very easy to be fooled into thinking or to assume that that means everything is 5% faster. And that's not very exciting, because if your application is fast enough, you don't really need, you, you might be easily, you might find it easy to dismiss a 5% speed improvement that's across the board because your application is fast enough today, 5% faster will still be fast enough. It's not going to change your business. It's not going to, um, it's not going to solve any real problems that you have. In reality, many of these changes, and this is the theme that I really wanted to focus on, it, many of these changes are addressing problems that users had. They're addressing discrepancies where some things were fast and other things were slow, or some things were, f were fast, but they couldn't make them any faster because of hardware. The, the Postgres didn't adapt to the hardware changes. They could, they could increase the, si the amount of memory, but Postgres wouldn't use it, things like that. Um, so when you see Postgres got faster. There was some improvement that made Postgres faster. It's really about there was some user that had a problem, or many users that had a problem that limited how they could scale their database or how they could use their database. And we solved that problem. And that means you might have that problem. You might run into this. You might have one, an outage one day, and the new version wouldn't have had that outage. The risks of upgrading. Um, you need to balance against the risk that the new version solved the problem, that the risk of not upgrading means you, you could be at risk of running into one of these problems. That, and you report it only to discover that, well, if you'd been on the new version, it had been solved already because you're not the first person to run into it. So one day you change your queries the behavior isn't what you expect, or you increase a parameter and you don't see the performance benefit you expect, or you, you improve your hardware and Postgres runs into a limitation, and you're not the first person to run into that, the new version might have, uh, might have solved that. So that's the introduction. Um, this is uh, the big picture. This is the last. Uh, 13 years, I couldn't quite go back 20 years for reasons I can get into in Q&A, um, but I managed to check out and build old versions of Postgres with modern tools on modern hardware, so all of these results are comparable. Uh, this is the only difference between these, uh, these data points is 
the Postgres code. So this is not comparing the way Postgres behaved 13 years ago with the way it behaves today on modern hardware. This is comparing the way it would behave today if we hadn't changed the code with the way it behaves today with the new code. And um, hmm, uh, the battery is dying in this. OK. So the la I can't use the laser pointer, but actually uh, the battery. So OK. Um, so this starts at 7.3. And you can see some, the, the early days, there was a lot of fluctuation. The performance improved dramatically. And then later on, there were very specific increases, very specific versions. And a couple things to highlight about this chart. First of all, it's a log scale chart. So you, you don't be, be confused. The differences at the top are just as large percentage-wise as the differences at the bottom for like a six inch drop is the same percentage improvement as a six inch drop on the faster queries. So the differences that, seem, that might seem small at the top are actually um, major, like that's a twofold difference. Hmm. No. The, the, um, the difference between those top two lines is a factor of two and the difference lower down between uh, uh, the green and the, well, it's hard. Um, so, but each of these lines is a different query. Most of them uh, are just doing sorting. So the blue line at the bottom is a plain sequential scan. The green, yellow, and red above it are sorting uh, binary data, floating point data, and integer data. And the, so these are just sorting binary data, sorry, the green is the integer, the yellow is floating point, and the red is a binary blob, a, um, a byte A. And the top two are sorting text. Uh, the blue one is uh, sorting text that doesn't fit in work mem, so it needs to do, uh, I'm going to go into details on the algorithm, uh, it needs to do it, it in repeated passes, and the red is if it all fits, this, uh, configured with a very large work mem, so it all fits in memory. Um, unfortunately, all of these, they actually fit in the physical memory of the machine. Uh, I did run a benchmark where it didn't, and there was a pretty small difference. It actually didn't really illuminate anything in the chart, uh, and it made it more cluttered. So I'll repeat this chart after each improvement so you can see what the impact is. So 1995. It was the first public release. I couldn't compile it. It's not in that chart. But I did go look at the code. It, the sorting module was 600 lines of code at that time. Uh, is, turns out sorting is a, a, a difficult intellectual ex extra exercise, but it doesn't actually require a lot of code. Um, that code is actually fairly similar to what we have today. What we have today is a lot more lines. There's a lot more features and error handling and um, some optimizations that inflate the, the size of the code. But structurally, it's very similar. Um, it, um, there's one major change between that and, and what we have today, which is um, when the code, when the data fits in memory, um, Vadim in, in 1998, 1997, sorry, added um, the, the change the behavior. So when your data fits in memory, it uses an algorithm called quicksort. Now quicksort is important to understand because it's actually fundamental to a lot of, um, it's, 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 it's actually what you're using in many cases. Often your data does fit in memory. Um, it has a lot of advantages. Uh, one of the main advantages is it doesn't need to be tuned for the size of the CPU cache, the, or the um, doesn't need to be tuned for the, the 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 various cache levels. Actually, not just the CPU cache. Um, it because it it uses a divide and conquer uh, method. It it breaks down your data into successively smaller chunks. It eventually reaches a point where it fits in your CPU cache, and it always takes advantage of that equally, it, regardless of um, the more CPU cache you have, the better the performance. It doesn't need to, you, it, Postgres doesn't need to be told to tune. 
uh, to, to tuned to take advantage of it. It has other advantages. It has a very low uh, overhead uh, constant factor. So it's, uh, all these sorting algorithms are n log n, but the, constant, the factor in front is relatively small in quicksort. There are some other factors. It's, it's, it has some downsides as well. The code in Postgres is actually uh, used as an example in, in uh, some discussions online. You can, you can find interesting papers on quicksort. And the, the quicksort in Postgres is a good example of um, which of those downsides need to be addressed. I'm not going to go into detail on how quicksort works beyond the important thing to understand is that it's, it's a very efficient algorithm and it, um, it makes use of the CPU cache well. Um, but the, uh, the, the key point is it only works if your data fits in memory. When your data doesn't fit in memory, we need to do an external sort. And I do want to spend a few minutes talking about external sort because it's the ba a lot of the improvements over the years have been to this algorithm, um, including fairly recently. The algorithm that we use is almost straight out of this book. This book was published in 1973 by Donald Knuth. Uh, it's been the Bible for computer programmers for all that time. And in fact, the comments in the code sp refer to specific page numbers and, and steps of the algorithm in, in the book. Um, I'm going to try and rush through this because there's some new ch recent changes in Postgres at the end of the talk, and I want to leave enough time for them. So this is fairly technical, but um, it, it, it's, it helps to understand the improvements. The basic strategy is that you can only fit some of your data into memory. Um, and you want to sort all of it. So you're going to fit into memory what you can, sort, generate a sorted subset of your data, the, si the size of your memory, or actually hopefully lar as, as much larger as you can um, than memory, and then work on the next batch and generate another subset. Uh, and then once you've generated all of these, these sorted subsets, you need to merge them into one long sorted list. Uh, and your goal is, one of the goals uh, is to make these subsets as large as possible, and it's actually possible to generate sorted subsets that are larger than you can actually fit in memory at any one time. Uh, so the, the first step is generating this sorted subset. And in this example, you have to imagine that you can only fit three datums in memory at a time. Obviously, in reality, you're going to fit thousands, uh, but it's harder to put on a slide. Uh, so. You load the first three into memory. You load it into something called a heap, which lets you extract the, the least element from that subset. It, it's, it shifts up to the top. And then you uh, output that least element to your sorted subset. Then you move on. You, now you're, you update the heap. And things sh shift upwards. And you load the next value, which is the fourth value here. And now the, you know what the, next, the least element of the, the first four elements is, and that one gets outputted. And you proceed. Eventually, you reach a point where there's an element that you've missed your chance. It should have been outputted, ideally, back here. But you don't have an infinite amount of memory. You had to output something. You've outputted the B and the C already. So you've now discovered, oh, there's an A. It's too late. It's missed its chance. So you have to mark that A as being part of the next sorted subset. And you proceed. You, in this case, you can output the D. And then you, you have another element, B, that also missed its chance. But you can still output the F. And now you discover, oh, there's actually a G. I can still output that G. I, that still hasn't missed its chance. And eventually, you reach a point where the next element belongs to the second set, the second sorted subset. They're actually called runs. So now you start outputting elements to the second run, and so on. And you actually have to continue. You might generate three, four, you might generate hundreds of these runs. And this is, I'm sorry if I'm going too fast, but um, this, I, as I said, there's, there's recent changes that I've added, and I'm worried that 
it's going to be too long. Is, is, this, is this fairly clear? It, it kind of depends on the idea, you know, already knowing what a heap is, which I didn't want to get too much into. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the key point is you're generating these sorted runs. And the sorted runs are, are a subset of your data. Uh, and uh, I meant to put that up when I asked if there were any questions. But um, then the next step is you want to merge all these sorted runs. And again, that uses a heap. You load the first element of each run. That tells you what the first element that you need to output is. And then you need to replace that element. That, that first element came from run two. So we need to replace it with the B so that the heap always has exactly one from each run. It's sort of exactly the way you would merge a pile of name cards at the registration desk, you would, you would have a bunch of piles that are all sorted and take the one that goes next. And now you've exposed the next one in that stack of cards. Um, so we replace it with, with B. Sorry, we replace it with B2. And that's a bit confusing. We replace it with B2 there, which came from the run. Output the B that's B1. And then we replace that with C1. And we continue. And we can merge all of those runs. There's one detail that isn't apparent in this slide. Um, that works fine if you've got three runs. And you can fit three things in memory. But if you have more runs than you can actually merge in one step, you might need to repeat the process and merge repeatedly down to fewer and fewer runs. Knuth actually goes into quite a bit of detail about how to schedule that merging. because. Um, especially in 1973, tape machines were expensive, tape machines were slow, and you spent a lot of time rewinding tapes, uh, a lot of time changing tapes. So there's, there's algorithms here for what to do if, uh, I, it's hard to point out, but some of these are each different orderings in which to schedule these merges. And this is, a, this is in the book, it's a fold out page that you, it's, it's like a picture book. It's, it's, um, one, of these, one of these algorithms is if you can run your tape, machine, your tape machines backwards, then you can write all your things to one tape and then read going back the other direction and then write, and it's more efficient than if you have to rewind. Some tape machines couldn't do that, so there's an algorithm there. If, you, if, if your operator needs to change tapes, how long they schedule, it's, it's calculated in. Um, these factors don't, didn't really, Ma they aren't really that relevant to Postgres these days. Not many people are running on tape machines. So our algorithm, obviously these tapes are just files on disk. Um, rewinding is really fast. Um, <laughs> so one of these, I think it's the third one, is the one we, the, the we implemented in 1997 there. Um, Tom, uh, so two, two years later, 2000, uh, Sorry, 2000. Tom, re actually, that's 1999. Oh, it was released in 2000, but the code went in in 1999. Tom rewrote some of this code, namely the abstraction layer that represents these tapes, so that it would reuse space. So that instead of having a file for each tape, there would be a, a, a file with some blocks belonging to one tape and some blocks to the next tape. And the key point there was a, already. The, the, this point, Postgres is mainly sort of an academic exercise or an early uh, internet days. There weren't a lot of big production systems running on it. But already, people were pointing out that you know, it kind of sucks that you need to store the one copy of the data and the copy that you're merging and the copy that you finally output. You needed a lot more disk space than you, the size of data you were actually storing. So he solved that problem. And this is what I was getting to at the beginning about these aren't just speed improvements. These are solving problems. Um, so after this change, you basically needed as much temporary disk space as the amount of data you were sorting. Not two, three, or uh, the worst, in some cases, four times as much disk space as, as you were actually sorting. Um, it also removed uh, a limitation. I th yeah, so when the data was more than two gigabytes, it used to be that none of the tapes could be larger than two gigabytes. So he, he, he's multiplexing files in a clever way. So you could actually sort more than two gigabytes of data on disk at a time. Um, oh, and there was a second. I, I've mixed up. The, these two went in. Uh, these are two steps of uh, the same change. 
the same. These are. This is what I was just talking about before about the uh, reusing, uh, avoiding the multiplying the storage space. These changes were in 7.0. I mean, this is these days. It sounds like early days, but I, I was, I wasn't involved yet. But I was. This was uh, quite relevant to <laughs> back then. Um, oh yeah, and then another major change. He actually used this code when you're building an index. It used to have its own sorting code with its own behaviors. So at this point. 2000, the code looked very similar to what we have today. It quick sorts if it's in memory. It uses these tapes uh, on disk if it's, if it's doing an external sort. It's using these, this heap in memory to, to generate these runs and then the heap to, to merge it. Um, until a couple weeks ago, that was pretty much exactly what happened when you ran sort in Postgres today. Um, it took six years before somebody said there, there was really, I mean, at this point, 2007, people are using this in production on the internet for websites. They're using it for their, to run their business. This was very usable. Like the, this was production level code, production quality code. Uh, but in 8.2, um, Simon Riggs came along and said, this, these, this stuff from Knuth about tape drives. Um, back in 1973, it was a pretty reasonable assumption that you would have some fixed number of tape drives in your data center, and you weren't going to go buy more tape drives just to run a sort faster. Um, it's a lot easier to buy more hard drive, the hard uh, files on your hard drive. Why are we still merging Oh, well, um, I showed merging three tapes. In fact, the, the Knuth algorithm merges. I should actually point that out. Here, all of these have the same number. All of these algorithms have seven tape drives. It's all about how to make the best use of your seven tape drives. Um, so Simon Riggs pointed out, we can have dozens of tape drives or hundreds of tape drives. We can have whatever number makes sense for the sort that you want to do. And as a result, the performance dropped in these queries uh, by about a factor of four, two, two to four. So the sorting, uh, sorting, I can't see the colors. Uh, the top one sorting by day dropped from almost, well, dropped from about 45 seconds to about 25 seconds. Uh, some of them were even, I think, slightly better. Uh, the idea is uh, you, can have, you, you can have as many tape drives as you can merge in memory in one shot. Uh, the limitation is basically if you, whether you have enough memory to buffer enough I.O. that you're not jumping between tape drives too often. So we want to read uh, several kilobytes or uh, about 100 kilobytes, I think, from a given tape drive file at a time. We don't want to read one record and, and one record and one. If you have a million, you're only going to be able to fit one record from each tape drive. If you have um, a, a machine with a reasonable amount of memory, you can probably have you can have thousands of files and read uh, several hundred k from each file in each in each step. So he, he implemented that. He calculates how many can it read from each. How much can it fit in memory? How many tapes can it fit in memory if it's reading several uh, hundred kilobytes? from each tape. And now it merges typically hundreds of tape drives in one step. And the interesting behavior observation there is usually you can do one merge. You don't need to schedule these multiple merge passes. Uh, though back in 2006, you might have, if you're doing data warehousing, you still might have needed multiple merges. Today, probably not. So just to look at that graph again, that's this first big drop here. And you'll note it affects, it affects um, all the different data types, um, but it doesn't affect this blue line on the top. That's the one where, sorry, it doesn't affect uh, either of these. Uh, 
this is a uh, quick sort. It shouldn't affect that. It does affect the blue, but I think uh, this uh, I need to look into that. This might be the one where that was actually doing I.O. I might have dropped the wrong line there. I think that I'm going to look into that. Uh, then this guy came along with the nice shirt there. And <laughs> he noticed that sometimes he, he was working on a website. And he needed the, to do paging, where you display the first 10 results, and then go on to the next 10 results, and the next 10 results. But he had thousands of results. Uh, and he only wanted to display a page at a time. All right. No, it's um, uh, what? Tom oh yes. So the way we do, I wasn't a committer, so I would submit the patch, and Tom re reviewed it and edited it, and probably rewrote it, and committed it. Um, <laughs> Typically, we give credit at the end of the commit message. There may be some where I had to cut off the last few lines of the commit message, but usually you'll see the credit at the bottom. Um, so the idea was, if you only need the first 10 results of your, or the, or the second 10 results of your data set, you don't actually need to sort the entire result set in order to just get that subset. You do need to look at all the rows, but you can once you've determined that a row doesn't fit in that subset that you're interested in, you can throw it out. You don't need to keep moving it around and comparing it to other values. Um, and this works especially well. Well, typically, you're doing a small enough subset that we never did implement this for uh, external sort. So this only uh, runs when you're sorting in memory because you're probably fetching 10, 20, 100, 200 values. They're going to fit in memory. Uh, but you are going to have to process all the rows. The, the, the biggest win is when sorting the entire data set would have to have been done on disk. But now we can sort just, the, we pull out those top 100, process all the rows in memory. And so you can, I mean, the, the performance impact is arbitrarily large depending on how much data you're sorting versus um, the, the size of the page. But you can see this impacted just this one. It brought this purple line here from basically the same speed as sorting text uh, in, on disk. God. Yeah, it, so up here, it's the same as the blue line. Oh, I know what the other change. This is the more tapes had a big impact because you're not actually reading all of the uh, the, the values. Yeah. So more tapes means you're likely to be doing it in a single pass. So you're likely to be done ve uh, very early in the process. Whereas before, <coughs> you, you might have to do multiple passes and you'll have to do all but the final one right to the end. Anyways, so it brought it down from similar to other sorting to almost the same as a sequential scan. Because it does have to process all the data, but it's just processing them in memory. And so this, this is a 10, 20, 30, 40 seconds and, a, sorry, four seconds. And this sequential scan is about one second, whereas before it was several minutes. Uh, and everyone thought that was brilliant for four more years until another guy with a striped shirt, uh, Peter Gagan, <laughs> Uh, became uh, a force for <laughs> a force for sorting speed, and said it's it's crazy that we're using these generic comparison operators that need to go through a lot of overhead to do sorting, and we have this generic sorting code that needs to call these uh, these generic functions. When if we special if we implement a special function for each data type. And in, in a way that, that is visible in C code, and this is um, a very technical change, but the important thing is to specialize the quick sort for each data type so that it could be, the compiler could inline these functions and could optimize the, the quick sort to, to so the, if you're sorting integers, it becomes just straight binary 
code that will sort the integers in memory. Um, in memory and without, without going through all of these levels of abstractions. Um, and the, 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 and one of the nice things about this is then it gives us a place where we can implement optimizations specifically for integers or specifically for floating point or specifically for text. Whereas right now, all we could have is, well, uh, prior to this change, all we had is a comparison operator that we could imp optimize, but it didn't know it was being used in the midst of a sort. And in, this is an, um, a use, uh, well, this is the specializing the quick sort for each data type. <coughs> and this had a, l a large impact. This brought sorting um, integers and floating points down from, uh, in, in this data set. This data set, by the way, is about a gigabyte. So it's, it's not so large that it's, it's like large, large data, but it's large enough to, to for, for these benchmarks when I'm having to run it hundreds of times. Um, brought, brought it down from, well, you see there's two, ch no, this is sort support. That was the earlier changes. Um, it's a bit hard to read there. Brought it down from about 18, to 17 seconds down to, it's about a 30% improvement. Um, but the important thing is this allowed later changes, which I will get to imminently. Um, so right now we're, we're up to here. And this looks like a small change, but when you realize it's a log scale graph, so this is 10 seconds, that's 20 seconds. The next line is double the, uh, the time. Um, incidentally, there was an, uh, um, an interesting speed improvement here. Um, that's because that was a point in time when 64-bit machines became quite common. Prior to, well, prior to 7.3, Postgres didn't support 64 bits at all. And that's why I couldn't run these benchmarks. Um, but up to here, people, the 64-bit machines were high-end machines. They were relatively uh, obscure. By, by 2008, people, 2009, people were running 64-bit laptops and 64-bit in a lot of places. And somebody commented that really floating point numbers can be passed around in 64 bits. We don't need to be passing around pointers to them. That was Im improved. And the impact is visible in the sorting code because suddenly sorting didn't need to be passing around pointers and, um, um, and it's faster. But it's, it, it's an interesting example of the hardware changes cha uh, driving the, the improvements. Um, a couple more things in passing. Um, problems that users reported was raising their work mem settings. I think it was still called sort mem at this time. Um, and not finding Postgres using all of work mem. Um, this one was because, I think, yeah, this one was because we double the amount of the size of some of the data structures at each step. And if you was using 55% of memory, it couldn't double it anymore. So it would use, at worst, about 51, 55% of your memory, and some, usually somewhat better. But um, people were expecting it to use the amount of memory they had configured. These are problems that impacted users. And the, the small release notes that sound technical actually reflected real problems that were fixed. And um, upgrading would mean avoiding running into that problem yourself. Uh, how much time do I have left? <laughs> okay, I'm, this is another such change where you were limited to two gigabytes for reasons that were internal and not relevant to the user. Again, people were complaining and we, it was addressed. Um, I'm going to, <laughs> I, wanted to <laughs> I wanted to talk about this. It's relevant. Um, this is driven, this was users complaining, you know, they, they're sorting data in, uh, prior to about, about 2010 or so, they te text meant ASCII. 
at least in the US, but even in most of the world, text wa was really, uh, Postgres always had fairly good support for collation, but it was uh, non-US collations and non-ASCII um, encodings, but it, it was slower and people knew it was slower and a lot of people chose to run in ASCII because that was, I think that was the, the, by the dominant choice. But that changed over time and by this time, pr most people would just configure Unicode without thinking about it, without considering, because they need that, that code, that support. And the co uh, but it is a lot slower to compare Unicode text strings in, in complicated collations. Um, so people expect it to be comparable to s comparing ASCII text. They, ex they don't expect to see a huge performance hit. And this was a change to address this, this unexpected huge performance hit. Um, and it is still something we want to support going forward we're going to need to address a problem, which is really a problem in the operating systems that, um, and, and I have slides here showing like how it works. It, you convert, the, the change converts these Unicode te uh, enco encoded text into this big binary blob. And then the binary blob can be compared um, just using uh, an efficient memory compare. Um, the problem is, the, some operating systems, these binary blobs that it generates don't compare in a way that's consistent with the normal collation comparisons. And so you would get actually broken indexes and bad results. Um, it was only in certain collations and only on certain operating systems. So going forward, we may be able to, uh, to identify when it's a problem and, and when it's not and make sure that we still use the optimization but only when it's not a problem. But hopefully, um, we'll, we'll have to see about that. The, the, the main takeaway, though, is the kinds of problems these changes fix it are these discrepancies where you expect two things to behave similarly or you expect your performance to be consistent and there's this inconsistent performance where you're comparing Unicode text and suddenly it's much slower than when you were comparing US addresses and ASCII. Um, however, there was a big improvement recently. Um, and this is why I went into so much detail on the, 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 the code, on the s generation of these runs. Um, one of the, 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 this change was inspired by um, a, a a sorting, a sorting, um, uh, pa a paper on sorting called AlphaSort, which talked in detail about the experiments they did generating these runs using different algorithms. And what they settled on, and th this was the, the, the AlphaSort paper was in the late 90s, but on large machines. These days, even on regular server, the lessons of that paper are uh, very relevant. So AlphaSort, um, well, not that AlphaSort, um, AlphaSort, a new, uh, this is the abstract of the paper, and that's uh, gray. Um, very respected, eminent sci um, computer scientist. Um, not a Postgres contributor, unfortunately, but um, the, one of the authors of the paper used quicksort to generate runs and replacement selection to merge the runs. Replacement selection is the, the algorithm where we merge those runs using a heap. But they talked about how they selected quicksort um, to, to generate the runs. They tried using a heap to generate the runs like we, like we did, and they found it wasn't really necessary. It, wasn't a, it was much slower. Um, quicksort will generate runs, you just sort what you can fit in memory. So it will generate more runs. The runs will only be as large as fit in memory. But quicksort is so much faster that the extra runs that you have to merge, um, you don't get back that performance. The, the I'm sorry, I'm, you're generating more runs so the merge step is slower. But quicksort is so much faster that you save so much time in the initial run generation that the merge doesn't, you, you, 
you don't lose as much as you, you saved in the first step. And the important observation is, as memory has grown, the likelihood that you need to do a second pass or a third pass, all of those complicated uh, mer uh, schedule, merge scheduling algorithms has gone down dramatically. And in fact, you can see if you configure a very small work mem, four megabytes, this is actually slower because it has to do these multiple passes. So if you're, if you're the largest table size uh, with the smallest work mem, um, it, it, it is actually noticeably slower. But even a halfway reasonable size uh, work mem, like 16 megabytes or 32 megabytes, you have to be sorting very large data sets to ever go into that second pass, the merge pass. And this, this change, which is sort of frustrating because it's throwing away all of that complicated algorithm, but um, this change is, 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 takes like 60% or, or so as, as much time as the, uh, uh, the old sorting algorithm. Uh, on a typical server these days, for 64 or 128 megabytes, you can, do, you can generate so many, um, you can afford to generate so many runs and still be able to merge them in a single pass. So that's, it's quite hard to see here because there were so many changes in short time. The final drop uh, here is where the most visible part where if you look at the, inter the green and the orange and the red line, they, they drop quite sharply at the end. Um, you can actually see it in the top as well. Um, that's why this is the one where, where it's external sort. The red one is quick sort. Um, it does drop down to where it's faster than 9.4, significantly faster than 9.4, even after you see the, the upward line is where we reverted the, uh, the Unicode, the STRXFRM fix. It's still faster than 9.4, quite significantly. Um, going forward, uh, your laptop forward, formats the text differently. Um, going forward, there's still things coming down the pipeline. Um, there's uh, Robert Haas, who just left the room, uh, is working on parallel um, infrastructure for parallel query. And there is a lot of, there, there's a good possibility we'll be able to use that to implement sorting on multiple CPUs. Um, there, we, there is talk of using SIMD instructions or GPU cards for sorting. There's actually already a contrib module to use GPU cards for, for sorting. Um, the, the, as the hardware changes and the usage pattern, the user's usage pattern changes, uh, it drives a lot of different priorities, as, you, like, talk, as I talked about with the tape drives. Uh, things change. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> That's the last slide. Any questions that I should, I can go back to the chart or anything? Pardon? I can't hear you. I see the sort library. Oh, I see you. Oh, yeah, I see you. Um, what do you think? So I used to be strongly in favor of our current approach because it would be consistent with all the other applications on your system. It uses the system collation. The ones that use ICU. Yeah. yeah, but the, like the, those ones are the ones that have to explain why they don't behave the same as the rest of your system. Um, but I, I think this latest incident has probably convinced me that that may be uh, the wrong decision. As Peter pointed out, like that bug, We've reported it now to the glibc people, and there's been no response. Right, like this is a minor part of glibc. Whereas that bug, if it were there in ICU, it would be a failure, a catastrophic failure of their main goals. So I think if we're if we're that going big deal for us. <laughs> if we're going to proceed with that kind of optimization and that kind of feature set, and the idea of like the point the the point of versioning uh, collations and uh, being able to deal with upgrade, like if you upgrade your libc and the collation changes, you don't, today you don't know 
and your indexes are all broken and you wouldn't know. So I, I think these later, this latest incident has gone a long way to changing my mind. <laughs> Well, across rel releases is a little more reasonable, but people expect their database but to be they, intact. Yeah, they yeah. don't expect it, they don't realize it. So I, I might be changing my mind, yeah. ICU, for those who aren't familiar, is a library for doing collation, and Unicode handling. Um, so instead of using the system libraries, and in, instead of being consistent with the system libraries, it would be consistent with other applications that use ICU. One of the main downsides is ICU is several times larger than all of Postgres. So having a dependency, but anyways, there's um, pros and cons there. So, um, so these characters are Unicode characters, they're more than one byte. They're not part of ASCII at all. Uh, so the collation rules, uh, well, the, you can have a collation rule for ASCII encoded text as well. That's complicated, like it could be case insensitive or um, it can consider case as secondarily to the text so that um, text that defers only in, co in, in case compares um, uh, not equal, but next to each other, even if, uh, uh, like, binary. W so um, A and capital A might sort in the logical order, but together, even if the text after them is, is all different. Um, so it's not just the bytes, it's the rules on how things are sorted. It's the rules on how things are sorted. But the rules on how to sort in America are relatively straightforward, whereas the rules on how to sort that are is substantially more complex. And those rules all have to be, like we have to call the function for sorting, um, the sure call, the, the function for doing the sorting, rather than just comparing the bytes of memory. Once we call strxfrm, um, then we can just call memcomp on these two binary blobs. And I guess I was skipping, uh, 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 I was making the assumption that back in the day, in 1996, when the internet first started, people were pretty satisfied, and there are still websites you can find out there where all capital letters sort before all lowercase letters, and people were pretty satisfied with that because th that's cl uh, close enough for a lot of uses. Well, so, well, <laughs> um, the way even the US Stir call is slower than memcomp because um, if you have James with a capital J and James with a low, um, uh, James with a lowercase j, rather than have all the capital letters come before all the lowercase letters, James and James would sort next to each other. The capital letter might still be before the other one, but it won't be separated by all the other lowercase letters. But that's still relatively simple. This is much more, you can actually see, um, even though they start with the same letter, sorry, sorry, different letters, they both start with the same binary blob in the first three bytes, that, or nibbles, rather. Um, apparently, Cyrillic is notoriously complicated to sort. <laughs> um, also, you need rules on how to compare that with ASCII text, which is not obvious. <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Uh, the keynote will be 